morning, church. Are you ready to worship? Because I am. Come on, bring everybody into the room and sing this with me. We love to call your name in time. serve a great God. Yeah. Here we go. Let's bless the Lord. Yeah. Water turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Yeah. 
into the darkness you shine and out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you there's none like you Hey! Okay. 
such a great God, such a great God. Come on, right where you are, just lift those hands toward heaven. Father God, we thank you for your presence, your anointing, your deliverance, your transformation in our life. We give this moment to you right now completely and freely in the mighty name of Jesus. And the whole church, the whole body says amen. God bless you. Amen. Grab your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. All right, I'm reading from the Amplified. So the Amplified is the Bible for dummies. It is. It's, 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 that's why I read it. I'll be that, right. Uh, so it has extra words. Uh, so when you hear, hear a word that ain't in your version, it's because I'm reading from the Amplified. It says this, by faith, that is, with an inherent trust and enduring confidence in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, by faith we understand that the worlds, universe, and ages were framed and created, formed, put in order, and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Uh, it, is, it is said once that in all of creation there are are things that are known, and there are things that are unknown, and between the two are doors. Everybody say doors. There are things that are known, and there are things that are unknown, and between the two there are doors. Uh, we talked a little bit before, and I suggested to you guys that faith was going to lead us into a conversation about doors. i give you a better, more... Uh, up-to-date current example. Uh, in 2010, I sat in the barbershop with uh, Melanie, this wise scholar. Uh, he was a scholar for the ages, had decades of wisdom from decades of experience. However, he had not graduated from Harvard. He had not gone to law school. This was Antoine Perkins. Antoine Perkins was a scholar because Antoine had learned the science of breaking in cars. Yeah, he's one of those. He's from Chicago, but he probably broke in some of y'all cars. Antoine told us at the barbershop one day about a car he had recently broken into. So one of the guys in the barbershop said, man, that's why I tint my windows. So y'all can't see what's in my car. Twan said, that's for rookies. Twan said, I don't need to see in your car. He said, I've been doing this so long, I, I, I have an idea that those of y'all that tinted your windows probably got the best stuff anyway. He said, because you don't want me to see in. And he said, I've been doing it so long, I no longer need to see in the car to know what's in the car. I said, Twan, you, you, you are a scholar and a scientist. And what we learned from that conversation, you all, is that when you have walked away long enough, your faith reaches a point that it exceeds your sight. I'll say that again. When you have walked a way long enough, your faith will reach a point where it exceeds your sight. Which means, watch this, Twan no longer had to see beyond the door to know he wanted to open the door. He didn't know what was on the other side of the door, but he knew there was something worth opening the door. 
there was something worth, watch this, him taking the risk of being caught, even though he didn't know what it was. How many of us are willing to take risks without knowing what it is on the other side? Faith leads to doors. Text tells us by faith we understand. Write this down. Faith causes us to know. Faith causes us to know what we previously did not. Faith causes us to know what we previously did not know. We write down, look up this way. Twan had broken in so many cars that now he knew without knowing which cars to go after. When you have walked with God long enough, you get to a point where God don't have to spell everything out. When you first come to God, when you first meet Jesus, there's no offense to anybody here. If you just accepted Christ this year, last year, last week, uh, it is understandable that you're going to have a whole lot of questions for God. It is understandable that God will say to you, I want you to go, I want you to go do, and you're going to be like, why, when, who, how, what, what, what you talking about, why me, why now, you know. And, and so we have these lists of conversations and things we go through with God and this dialogue. But after you've done it enough times where you have tried him enough times, and each time you've tried him, he has proven himself faithful over the years. Hear this, the questions should be less. Don't mean you're not going to have questions, but they should begin to shrink because he has proved his faithfulness. Faith, you all, allows us to know what we previously did not know. What do you mean, Pastor? It does not mean in the current situation you will know what is on the other side of the door, but you are now convinced and you have known that God has been faithful consistently that no matter what he tells you about the other side of the door, you know that whatever is there, it is something that is for your good and it is worth the risk. Faith allows us to know what we previously could not know. And in this text, what we did not know before and then should know is that the worlds were framed and created. All right, y'all ready to go a little bit deeper? Everybody awake? All right, here we go. Worlds is plural. When you look throughout Scripture, even when they talk about uh, the authority of Jesus Christ, he says Jesus is over thrones and kingdoms and realms. Those of y'all that have been here all year and the last year since we've been back, we've kind of had this conversation about multiple realities existing and multiple realms existing. Uh, I, I hate to break this to y'all, but the MCU, Marvel, was not the first person people to come up with the idea of multiple universes. Uh, Doctor Strange did not find that out. Well, many times we miss, and this is good and bad, can't stay here, we're going to keep moving, but let me say this, uh, is that Hollywood does not create anything. Hollywood finds true information and manipulates it for the purpose of entertainment. Now, that's good and bad. We'll deal with that a whole nother day. There are, watch this, multiple realities that exist. I know. You're like, it's too early for this. In God, every possibility is. Now, from a very practical standpoint, logical standpoint, let me bring back to the logical people, that, that, that would explain to you how God can always be where you need God to be. He doesn't have to wait for us to decide. He is in every decision you could have made. 
God is this. Write it down. God exists in all possibilities. We can even see this in the scripture, you all, because what faith does is faith allows us to see what he sees. God stands, pastor, in a place where he is always at once seeing all possibilities. So that night you was at the club. <laughs> and a tall, dark, fine man came up to you. Well, you thought he was fine because it was dark. <laughs> and you had a couple of communion juices, you, so you just, you, you weren't. <laughs> but you think he was fine. He could have been fine. As that man stands in front of you, hitting you with all the game he got, God stands outside of time looking at every possible decision that can come from this moment. So God stands watching a you that says yes. He's watching a you that says no. He's watching a you that throws a drink in his face. He's watching a you that gives him your number. He's watching a you that goes home with him. He's watching a you that don't talk to him for a month. He's watching a you that marries him. He's watching a you that divorces him. He's watching a you that has kids with him. He's watching a you that walks away and never says a word to him. He stands and he's watching every version of you. So no matter which way you go, he is there. No matter which way you choose, he is there in the possibility of what you have chosen. That's why there's no mess you can get yourself into that God can't get you out of. He's already made the provision. He's watched the you that is committed to the church, then left the church, then came back to the church, then left the church, then picked another 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 church, picked another church only to end up back at the church you left the first time. And he's been with you at every church. He's been with you in every season of you, in every version of you, in every season. Don't look at me like that. We change yous every five minutes. The you you are right now ain't the you you was five minutes ago because five minutes ago your stomach wasn't growling. <laughs> Ladies, five minutes ago your cramps hadn't started. Y'all change with them. <laughs> y'all, y'all be a whole, some of y'all be a whole nother you. But, uh, Testify, brother. Testify. <laughs> Peter, the you that we were when we had hair, ain't the you we are when we lose it. <laughs> Y'all don't believe me. Y'all don't believe me. Let me give you some Bible. Let me give you some Bible. The one whom you love is sick. Jesus says, that's cool. We're going to hang out a few more days. Jesus finally turns to the disciples and says, all right, let's go check on Lazarus. Because he's asleep. Now, Lazarus at that point was dead as a doornail. Lazarus was gone. Lazarus was not going to be brought back by CPR or mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Lazarus is gone. They got the sheet over his body. He's in the morgue. Lazarus is gone. He's already in the tomb. He is buried. And Jesus says the boy is asleep. Jesus, watch this, simultaneously sees Lazarus as alive and dead, which changes his language concerning Lazarus. Jesus, here it is, does not declare 
what he wants to see, Margot. He is declaring what he does see. Uh, okay, let me, let me say that again. Let me say that again. He does not call Lazarus dead out of faith. He is not declaring those things which be not as though they were. He's not, he's not declaring something that he wants to see happen. It is not the same as going to the car dealership saying this car is mine. It ain't yours. It's, it's, the, it's the dealers. It ain't yours. Stop touching it. Stop pouring oil on it. Stop. Matter of fact, stop pouring oil on stuff you want. I don't know what church told y'all to do that. Stop pouring oil on stuff you want. Some brother's like, is that why she keep pouring oil on my leg? Stop, just, 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 stop pouring oil on stuff you want. Let it be. Leave it alone. Uh, it, it, it ain't yours. It is not Jesus. Jesus declaring, watch this, he is not declaring what he wants to see happen. He is declaring what he sees. When Jesus looked out into the universe of creation, he did not look at a dead Lazarus. He looked at the living Lazarus. Uh, this is why he could go to a tomb. And call the boy's name. We would never do that. We shouldn't. <laughs> Mama! <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. We would never do it. Watch this. Because we only see one reality. He sees them all. Now, this was going to mess some of y'all up. That's why he calls you whole. When you just been broken. That's why he calls you healed. While you have cancer. That's why he calls you strong when you are weak. That's why he calls you wealthy when you have bills you ain't paid. That's why he calls you powerful when you have not an ounce of power left in your body. That's why he calls you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, because he's not looking at the you that you see. Faith is rooted, here it is, not in what I see, but what he says he sees. The worlds were framed by his word. There is no universe or existence or reality, Tori, in which you have not already been framed. How do you think you have made it this far? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no let's, let's be honest for a second. Let's be honest. Let's, let's, let's go through our resumes for a second. Because we say stuff like God, you know, and to God who's the head of my life and give him glory and honor to the church. And every rapper and singer get up and say, I want to thank God for this, to Jesus Christ for this award. But I don't think we really, really understand how we made it this far. It, and then we sing songs, we made it this far by faith. No, you ain't made it this far by faith. We have made it this far because we have been framed. You got home drunk, drunk. And it wasn't your car bumper that kept you from hitting the pole. It was the frame. You know how many folk most of us in this room that laid up with? Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. And the same one you laid with, your cousin laid with, your auntie laid with, your brother laid with, your friend laid with, and they got up with fleas and demons and lost their mind. But some kind of way you still here, I can tell you it was not Trojan that kept you. 
Don't look at me like that. Don't look at me. Ain't no little thin piece of plastic kept you. It was the frame. Your girlfriends got kids out of wedlock and have lost their mind and had to reduce themselves to make ends meet. But you are still here and managed to finish school and get a job. And here you are not because you cute. It was the frame. I don't care what churches tell you we were ingenious and we were intuitive and we came up. Ain't no way a church is still here in 2022 unless there was a frame. It ain't your therapist, it's the frame. It's not your income, it's the frame. It's not even our gifting. It's the frame. Ain't none of us that fine. I may be close. I may, I may be. I may be. Just a little. And keyboard. Keyboard might be close. Cause that his, his beard be like, boom. I, I'd be jealous. Like, man, I wish I can. It's like a chia pet. None of us are that smart. My pastor, and I need to keep going, my pastor grew our church from 200 people to 30,000 people at his peak. And I'll never forget one day we sat down, we're talking. After I started pastoring Boston, I, I asked him, I said, man, I don't know what I'm doing. What am I supposed to be doing? <laughs> he says, son, let me tell you a secret. And I lean, I'm leaning in because I'm like, oh, this is about to be good. He did, God then used him and church got to 30,000 people. And one year we gave, we uh, 25,000 people accepted Christ one summer. And we gave out 50,000 Bibles one year. And we closed down liquor stores in our neighborhood. I'm like, oh, this is about to be good. God, God, God about to give. This, that's why I'm crazy. When I come up with these crazy ideas, it's because of that stuff. Uh, and I say, you know, okay, all right, Pastor, how, what, what you going to tell me? He say, I don't know what I'm doing either. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I'm doing. He said, I, he said, son, I have never known what I'm doing. And any pastor that tells you they know what they're doing is either lying or the whole thing is based on them. I said, well, how in the world have you seen the successes that we saw growing up? He said, his word. The frame. When you hear this, understand that the frame, his word, is in all possibilities. Faith comes alive. Because now I worry less about what could happen. Because no matter what could happen, he has already happened. We learn by faith that the worlds were framed, created by his word, and that what is seen was not made from what is visible. Faith allows us to see what we can't see. This is why faith is the evidence of what we don't see. Faith is substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of what we don't see. Faith is evidence because it begins to prove to you and I that no matter which yellow brick road we go down, he's there. Because of this, here it is, faith will always lead you, write this down, to a supernatural door. Faith. Will always lead you and I to a supernatural. Actually, write this part. 
God ordained door. Next week, we're going to get real deep. But for now, doors. Faith leads to doors. Doors are, guess what? Openings. <laughs> yeah, I ain't nothing deep. Just, you know, doors are openings. Uh, those of y'all that like deep stuff, in the Greek, <laughs> door means, watch this, entrance. <laughs> I know, that was profound. That blew your mind right there. And that's in the Greek. Uh, doors, you all, are the movable, transcending barrier between two existences. That's for y'all deep folk. All doors, every door that has ever existed, exists to provide entry and exit for a place. You don't need a door any place you don't want access to. You don't want a door any place you don't want somebody to have access to. Multiple realities, multiple possibilities, if you will. It is behind doors that other realities and possibilities exist. Understand, again, remember we said God exists in all possibilities. So therefore, you and I have to be invited through these doors. Ain't no different than most of us. Some of y'all understand this real well. I got a bunch of guns in my house. Yeah, I got guns. I ain't got no problem. I got guns. Big guns. Well, I says, I got guns. And no alarm system. Because I have a very strong case of the I wish. <laughs> Glory! I am of the please camp. Please bust in this house. Come through that door uninvited if you want to. I got something for you. Some of y'all understand. Because you can't go indoors you haven't been invited into. Ooh. That's how some of us got, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself this next week, but that's how some of us got in the trouble we got into because we went indoors we weren't supposed to be in. And sometimes I'd rather you present me with a gun than a rose. <laughs> if you've seen misery, you'll understand. Watch this. Hear this. Y'all ready to go a little bit deeper? Got yeah, about 25 more minutes. Who, who's not ready to go deeper? Who want to stay right where we are? See how, see how shame messes with people? Because I can see some of y'all faces like, mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, here we go. A little bit deeper. Another level. Write this down. A door, <laughs> Pastor Margo, you're going to like this one, is trauma to a structure. A door is trauma to a structure. Say it again. The rest of y'all going to catch it real soon. A door is trauma to a structure. Because for the door to be, the walls got to get cut.
Every God-ordained door that has been set in my life has come with trauma. Yeah. Yeah. That might be why some of us have issues with God. That might be why some of us never get to the door. Because we don't see it as a portal for entry and exit, we see it as the point of a wound. Revelation, turn to Revelation. Let's keep going before I run out of time. Revelation. Chapter 3. Now you should be able to find Genesis and Revelation should be the easiest ones to find. Revelation chapter 3. Verse, chapter 3, verse 7 and verse 8. I'm going to read it from the Amplified. It says this. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, these are the words of the Holy One, the true one. He who has the key to the house of David, he who opens and no one will be able to shut, and he who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. See I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. For you got a little power and have kept my word and have not renounced or denied my name. Now, look up this way. The letter here uh, to the church of Philadelphia is unique among the seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelations begins with John on the island of Patmos, and he is writing, according to the Spirit, these letters to these seven churches. Each of these letters addresses different things to those churches, sometimes issues in those churches. Uh, but in this letter, seventh letter to the church of Philadelphia, it is unique because it is composed almost totally of promises Christ makes to this church and gives them reasons for the promises. This is different than the other ones because the other ones, there's always some part in the letter where God is cussing them out. Read them. Just try. They, they, they short. In almost every last one of them, God is cussing them out for something. Got an issue with you for this. I got an issue with this. Y'all tripping. Y'all crazy. Y'all doing y'all, y'all. This one, he says, y'all got little power. And I appreciate you, but this is what I'm going to do for you. I have set before you an open door that no one can shut. He makes the point to say that this is the one who holds the key to the house of David. This, you all, this key of David speaks to the authority of one who opens and closes without interference. This is because it speaks to the lineage of Jesus from David and David as king. And David's kingship and his royalty of his family and that lineage established an authority in the earth from which Jesus comes out of and even in the spiritual sense builds upon. And so in the earth realm and in the spirit, Jesus is the one with the key to the house of authority. This pulls from Isaiah 22. Write it down. You ain't got to look at it right now. But those of y'all like homework, Isaiah 22, verse 22 to 23. God prophesies concerning this house of David and this key of David, and he prophesies this very thing that Jesus says in Revelations. So John is declaring to us that Christ alone, no matter the situation, has the key and the ability to enter and exit the Father's presence unhindered. Now, when you and I have Jesus, that means we have access through him to enter and exit the 
Father's presence unhindered. This, you all, also gives us a glimpse or a look at a door in the earth realm. Right? Y'all still with me? All right. This door, I'm going to tell you up front, is the door of salvation. What he's talking about here is the door of salvation. This is why he says, I have opened a door no one can shut. That's why Jesus says, you in my hand, no one can pluck you out of my hand. There are some teachings, some theologies, and some doctrines that suggest you and I can lose our salvation. I, you can study, show yourself a proof, have not found anywhere in Scripture that supports that belief. Everything in the Bible speaks to that once we are his, we are his. And the only way that covenant is broken is to come against the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a whole other conversation, but I am 99.999% sure none of us have pulled that off. If you had, you probably would not be in church. (laughs) The door of salvation, its origin is in the earth realm. Now, stay with me. Here it is. This door is based on the call of a man and the faith of that man to walk in that call. That man is David. If David never accepts the anointing on his life, there is no house of David from which this salvation comes. Now, remember this. David, when he is anointed, is the forgotten son who is all by himself in a field with sheep. God decides (laughs) to create a door to eternal salvation By picking a dude whose daddy don't even remember him, and he's hanging out with animals by himself. Let me, let me, me God decides all all of history needs to be saved. I need to bring everyone through this door of salvation. Where am I going to build the door? I did not know what I'm going to do. Let me pick random dude out in the field smelling like animals and poop and sheep in the sun by himself who ain't close with his brothers and his daddy don't even talk to him that much. Let me pick him, the one who all his time is with sheep and all he does is wrestle with lions, tigers, and bears. The one who does nothing but sit and watch animals while talking to me. You keep diminishing your story because it ain't a bestseller but you only need one reader all right we gotta keep going we gotta keep going we got David's faith watch this and he needed faith to accept the anointing and not question it, but then this faith in God leads to his obedience to God. We cannot say we have faith in God and not obedient to God. Obedience requires faith. I had to have faith that my father loved me every time he beat me. I know y'all don't beat y'all kids no more. But uh, when you've been beat, your life has been changed. (laughs) David's faith in God leads to his obedience to God. 
and therefore revealing of a God-ordained door. If you look at the sequence of events of David's life, the door for David's kingship, listen, existed before David knew it was there. You know how crazy it'll be for us to invite y'all to the church building and ain't no doors? Not these doors. I'm talking about. Ain't no front doors. <laughs> Y'all like, yeah, ain't no doors. <laughs> front doors. <sighs> One day we're going to be able to say, you remember when we ain't had no doors? <laughs> because you would arrive at the building at the set time, at the set place, and not be able to walk into what you've been called to. When God calls you, hear this, he has already set the door for what he's calling you to. This door of salvation is the way of escape. Everybody say escape. It is the escape from the power of sin. So everybody here, if you've accepted Jesus Christ and you have the Holy Spirit, you and I are still going to sin, but we have the option to not sin. Those that do not have Jesus don't have the option to not sin. That's why I don't know why we're shocked when sinners sin. I can't believe they did. Why? You got Jesus and still. <laughs> oh, Lord. I got Jesus and still be in. And, you try, and I'm, I, I don't be shocked when sinners sin because I'm saved and still. Sin. But it set us free from the power of sin. The way of escape, this door provides an escape from the power of death. Death had a grip on us. The fear of death typically had to do with the fear of the unknown because we didn't know what was on the other side of death's door. This escape, this door, gives us an escape from the power of the grave and the power of hell. Faith, you all, hear this and we're done. Faith, salvific faith or salvation. This door of salvation will always lead you out of what the enemy has tried to hold you in. And the only way to find this door is faith. I'm going to prove it to you all like this. Uh, anybody here ever been to... Uh, like a play or a musical or something? Raise your hand. Play. Raise, your, raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. Be proud. All right. How many of y'all have never been to a play or a musical? Ever? Okay, we're going to put, put one on just for y'all next week. Uh, even at plays, musicals, but even movie theaters, I don't know if they still do it, uh, but I remember back in Chicago, you had this announcement before the movie started sometime, and you had this announcement before the play starts, you have an announcement before uh, uh, the musical stuff starts, where somebody somewhere says over a PA or a microphone, they say, please take note of the exits. In case of emergency, take note of the emergency doors. Usually in movie theaters and places, especially movie theaters, most of y'all know this, uh, you come in certain doors, but there are always these two doors down, kind of in the dark by the screen. And above those doors, there are signs that say exit, lit up in red lights. Architects, you all, don't hide the emergency doors. But they understand that in an emergency, you might not see the door. They understand that in an emergency, you may not, in the moment of chaos, people running around, smoke may be in the air, you may not know where the door 
is. And so what they do to make sure that you can find the door is they put a sign above it. And the sign is lit. So that if it's smoke, if it's darkness, whatever it is, you can see the sign. This is the amazing thing about the sign. The signs, those exit signs, are connected to the building's power supply, but they have their own power supply. So that in the event of any emergency, if the building loses its source of power, the sign still has its own power because it has to be seen when all hell is breaking loose. The sign has to be seen because the door might not be seen. Oh, some of y'all catching it already. You're going to catch it. Uh, it has to have power so when all else fails in darkness, you can look up and still see it. Take, 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 take note of the exits. Take note of the exits. Uh, because when, when God is stirring your faith, it's because you're near a door. Uh, uh, and when the devil is fighting your faith, it's because you're near a door. In that moment of chaos and darkness, when you can't see the door, when that is the moment that we are between prophecy and promise. Now, that's the crazy thing. We can't go back to the prophecy because God then already said what he said, and he ain't saying it again. Some of us keep wanting to go back and listen to the same word over and over again. You keep replaying the same message over and over. Ooh, it just blessed my soul. Ooh, bless. That was for 1982. If you don't let that word and that preacher in that 82 go, God stirs your faith. It's because you're near a door. When the devil fights your faith, it's because you're near a door. In that moment, we are between prophecy and promise. We can't go back to prophecy because God already said what he said. I'm close on this. My aunt was in the Twin Towers on 9-11. She uh, got, got spared her, got saved her. And she wrote a book very amazing story. And just from a personal standpoint, I, I remember my aunt was crazy. And she was a prince fanatic. My aunt, uh, it was it's 18 of them. Um, I had 18 aunts and uncles from my grandmother. I don't know how she pulled that off. Uh, but my aunt was the crazy one. Stayed in the club, stayed kicking. She was the wild child. All the rest of the kids was deacons and preachers and all kinds. Of, my aunt was the crazy one. Um, until 9-11. A after 9-11, my aunt has been the most insane preacher I have ever met in my life. But on 9-11, uh, she tells and has shared many stories. But one comes to mind that I think will help you grasp the point of today's conversation between faith and doors. She talks about when the plane first hit, that one, it was sudden. They had no plan. It was not on the calendar for a plane to hit their floor on that day. You don't have a schedule for when the enemy hits you. But somebody had to think about the possibility of the moment before the moment. She said the place was filled with black smoke. They couldn't see nothing. People everywhere. Some alive, some dead. Smoke is filling the air, the room, the space. There's debris falling from the ceiling. There is fire engulfing spaces around them. People are dying next to her. People are dying under her. They could not see the exit doors. But 
they knew the doors existed. Because they had seen them before planes hit. They had seen them because they had been in the space before. You'll be amazed at how many things God has shown you before your calamity that we tend to forget in the moment of calamity. They couldn't see the doors, but they knew the doors existed. They hoped to find the doors. And because they hoped, Margot, to find the doors, they kept looking for the doors. In the midst of the smoke, in the midst of the hail, in the midst of the debris, in the midst of the bodies, in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the flames, they kept hoping that somebody, some kind of way, even though they could not see, would find the door that they knew it existed. But how they would find the door, they had no idea. How do you find a door when you can't see? How do you find a door when you don't even remember where to look because everything is going crazy on it? But somewhere in the midst of everything that was happening suddenly they had an idea Sarah of where the door was how did they find an idea of where the door was Melanie when you said preacher they could not see they did not notice anything smoke was everywhere it wasn't because they saw the sign yet it was because on the emergency doors there was an alarm uh, and somebody, somewhere, Angela hit that door. And when that door opened, the door yelled. <laughs> Uh, Y'all catch it in a second. The door screamed. The door made a sound. The door opened its mouth. The door began to say, I'm over here. And so even though they could not see it, they all they had to do was turn their head in the direction of the sound. Woo. They had to hear where they could not see. And because they could hear where the sound was coming from, all they had to do was head in the direction of the sound. Faith comes by hearing. Ooh, you ain't got to see how it's going to work out. All you got to do is open your ears to begin to listen for the sound that God is making in your life. God is telling you where to get out. God is telling you how to move next because he gives a sound. Faith turned their eyes to where their ears had been. And then they saw Tracy the sign. Because he sat before us in exit. Even though they couldn't see right in front of them, they could still see that sign. Even though they couldn't see the door, they could still see the sign. Even though they didn't know which direction they were going in, they knew to just keep going in the direction of the sound. And if I keep my body down and my head up and my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help, I know which way to keep going. You got to just lift up your head and head toward the sound. God has said before some of you, doors that nobody can shut. They did not have to worry about if the door was going to close because the way this particular door was made, once you opened it, it locked in place. So it could not accidentally close. It could not be pulled closed. The ones that got out and may have wanted you to stay in could not shut it on you on their way out. The door was locked in place once it was open. Watch this. And the sound did not stop. The light did not go out. The light was still there and the sound was still going. The light was still there and the sound was still going. The light was still there and the sound was still going. The light was still there and the sound was still going. And the door could not be closed. The light was still there. The sound was still going. And the door could not be closed. The light was still there and the sound was still going and the door could not be closed. The light is still there and the sound is still going and the door cannot be closed.
closed door can't be closed by your mama. Your daddy can't close the door. Your uncle can't close the door. Your brother can't close the door. Your auntie can't close the door. The police can't close the door. Politicians can't close the door. The president can't close the door. Kings can't close the door. Queens can't close the door. Democrats can't close the door. Republicans can't close the door. Cousins can't close the door. The league can't close the door. Drink can't close the door. Addiction can't close the door. Witches, trauma, sickness, disease can't close the door. Depression, heartache, recession, rent, mortgage can't close the door. Landlords can't close the door. They can't close the door. <sighs> Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. Neither life nor death, neither angels nor principalities, neither things present nor things to come, nor height nor death. Nothing is able to close the door that God has opened in your life. This is your season. Even if you got to crawl, get to your open door. This is your moment, even in the smoke-filled nostrils with tears in your eyes. Crawl to your door. You know why the devil's fighting you like that? Because he don't want to let you out. Because if you get out, you live. You know why David had to fight lions and tigers in the field? Because the devil never wanted him to come out that field. tears in your eyes smoke in your lungs with the late notices on your desk with your lights cut out with no gas in the car by yourself again with your broken heart and your troubled mind with the weight of the world on our shoulders let it crumble you if it got to. But don't you stop crawling. Because God has given a sound in your life. You say, Pastor, what is the sound? It is the sound of his voice. He's been giving you a sound through your aunties and your uncles. He's giving you a sound through the drunk man on the corner. He's giving you a sound through random commercials on TV. He's giving you a sound in the preach moments in church and on TV and on online. He's giving you a sound. He's giving you a sound in your worship. The world don't need more preaching. The world needs a sound. We don't need better singers, we need sound. We don't need antics, we need sound. World is dying and going to hell because the church has been silent. We are the sound in the earth. For some of us, the devil fights your consistency with either the things of God, watch this, or the community of God. Because he's trying to diminish the collective sound. Some of you 
God ain't blessed your business. The devil blessed it. Some of us, God didn't give you that relationship. The devil gave it. Because he knew you might not head for the exit if you had company. Some of us here, you're more tormented by the loneliness than the smoke. So, Tori, he says, I'll give you this if you just stay here. Just sit in this space a little longer. Every head about every eye closed. Father, we thank you for the doors. More specifically, the doors of salvation. Lord, I thank you that there are those that are here that are the Davids of their family. Oh. That God, you have called them to be the door by which salvation comes to the whole family. God, we thank you there are people here who are doors for their community and their neighborhood, for their, do for their jobs. And the devil has fought them. God, we know as a church that you have called us to be a door of salvation in this community. And the devil fights us. But thank you that faith tells us that you are already in all possibilities. And faith tells us that even in this fight, it just simply tells us we're closer to the door. So now, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for each and every person in this place. Holy Spirit, breathe. For young couples that are lost in the smoke, let the sound lead them to the door. For my elders, my mothers and fathers in this room, those that are 60s and 70s and trying to figure out what to do in this phase of their life, Lord, lead them to their door. For the simple fact, God, that you still have them here means there's yet another door that they are called to. Lord, we thank you that every trauma is used by you to create a door. So we glorify you now. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen.